Well, good morning or good evening and to your families, wherever you might be, uh, watching or listening to this sermon. I hope that you are well. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll read the passage together. So to you bow as we pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. And that you speak to us today. Even in this time of crisis, we pray that you might be our refuge and our strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, why don't you just pause the video for a moment and just read Psalm 91 together as a family or a group. And then start the video again and we'll get started. Over the past few days, I've seen many people posting Psalm 91 on their social media accounts. Uh, Joy Magazine had the psalm as part of their recent communication package entitled God's Promises of Protection. Uh, Here are the sort of promises that the psalm makes. Verse 3, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. And verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right side, but it will not come near you. Verse 10, no evil shall be be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. Verse 12, on their hands angels will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Verse 14, I will deliver him, I will protect him. Now all these promises for us, uh, can we claim them? Uh, Do Christians need to fear the coronavirus? Is God protecting us from this virus? Well, in a world where Christians are getting COVID-19 and some are even dying, in a world where disaster has come into our tent, where evil is a reality and no angel has come to guard us, where we feel more like the 10,000 fallen than the one who doesn't need to fear. And does this mean that God's promises don't apply to us or is God being unfaithful to us? How do these promises of Psalm 91 relate to us as Christians? This is what we're going to be considering together. Well, firstly, I want to say that we are all vulnerable. The reality is that as we live in a broken, fallen world, we are all vulnerable. Uh, If you look at the wide effects of this virus, uh, we are reminded of our vulnerability. There is no bias to this this virus, no celeb who is immune, no sportsman it bypasses, no country is left untouched. And because of this innate sense of vulnerability, we all seek security. Security in wearing face masks, social distancing, panic buying, hand sanitizers. We are all desperate for desire for safety and security. We all seek refuge because we all know deep down that we are vulnerable. To be human is to be vulnerable. And it is only in times like these that we are currently facing where we are reminded of our vulnerability. We long to feel safe. We ache for security. And this is not a new development. In the ancient world, uh, cities were built, kings dug moats, soldiers wore armors and and carried shields. But despite all our efforts, there's no guarantee of security in this life. And as much as we love to think that God is protecting those who love him from trouble, we know that this is clearly not true from our experience and from the, the Bible, the teaching of the Bible. Even the best man, Jesus, was not kept from trouble and suffering in this world. God does not promise earthly safety in this life. Our hearts are wired to seek it, but we are never meant to find it in this world. We were always meant to find it in in Jesus. Satan loves giving us a false sense of security in this world, either by undermining his promises, by twisting his word, or by pointing us to securities in this world that cannot truly keep us secure. So this brings me to my second observation, the false security from Satan. Satan quotes the psalm to Jesus, and listen to Luke 4. I'm I'm going to read from verse 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. 
If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And here it is, verse 9. And he looked, and he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, if you are the King, throw yourself down from here, verse 10, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended their t- every temptation, he departed from him until a, an appointed time. Satan uses this promise in 91, made to God's king, and manipulates it. If you really are who you say you are, surely God will keep you away from danger. If God really is with his anointed king, can you trust these promises, Jesus? Don't you want to test God to see if he's really with you, the Messiah, the king of the world? If Psalm 91 is yours, Jesus, won't you prove it? Prove it. Satan loves giving us a false sense of security in this world by twisting God's promises or casting doubt on God's goodness. He would, love us to th- he would love us to think and claim these promises in this life. And when disease and when suffering does come into our tent, into our homes, into our country, we can then turn our backs on God because God has shown to be unfaithful. He would love the world to look in on Psalm 91 and doubt God's goodness to his people. As Jesus doesn't fall for Satan's schemes. He was not going to be test. He was not going to test God and wield God's promises like a magic wand. And Jesus, quoting scripture back to Satan, answered Satan and said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, Luke 4 verse 12. Jesus knew these promises were his as God's ultimate king, but would not be coerced into proving it. In fact, here's the the great truth. Jesus knew that these promises of security and refuge are only fulfilled through his coming suffering in this world. To claim these promises as God's king, Jesus would be denying the cross. The very place we found our salvation and our refuge. So instead of following Satan's bad theology of Psalm 91, Jesus embraces the path of suffering. Jesus has come in the world to suffer and die. He came to be crushed for us. You see, trying to apply the psalm as promises to us now in this current crisis is a misapplication of this passage. The writer of Psalm 91 was not mistaken or naive or foolish when writing this psalm. The writer of Psalm 91 was well aware of the truth of Psalm 44 verse 22 that that Paul quotes in Romans 8, which says, For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The writer of Psalm 91 stands with Jesus who said, Some of you will be put to death. And in the same breath said, But not a hair on your head will perish. The psalmist stands with the Hebrew writer um, by faith when he says, Christians will escape the sword and in the same breath that by faith others will be killed by the sword. God often wills that Christians suffer but forbids the suffering to be everlasting. Our true security and our refuge lies in the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus. Our security is guaranteed by God's King who would not bypass Calvary, but through Calvary make this psalm a reality for all those who would trust in Him. We have real security and refuge in the rubble in this world only through the cross of Jesus. So my last point is real security and refuge. Where can we find real security and refuge? Well, we are always meant to find it in God. We were always meant to find it in God's Son who resisted this poor attempt by Satan to quote Psalm 91 and distract him from the cross. Jesus knew that God's promises of angels guarding him in verses 11 and 12 would not keep him from the cross, but that his Father would raise him up by his own hand. 
Jesus went to the cross surrounded by his enemies, verse 7. He knew that evil would befall before him, verse 10. Jesus would strike against the, the stone at Calvary. But in enduring all of these things, even as God's king, he would tread on the line and trample the serpents under, underfoot. Psalm 91 verse 13. A promise made in Genesis 3 of a promise of a serpent crush, it comes true in Jesus on the cross. Listen to Genesis 3 verse 14 and 15. The Lord said to the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. On the cross, Jesus, our serpent crusher, experienced the greatest pain. Crushed, he bore our sin and he's, and he's, as he satisfies God's wrath, against our sin. But as he does that, the promises of Psalm 91 still stood for God's king as he hung there on the cross. The promise that God would be with his king in Psalm 91 gave him the strength to move towards pain and not run away from it. He knew that his God and Father would be with him, that his Father would raise him up to to glory at his right hand. His great comfort as he was nailed on the cross came from these verses in verse 14 and 16 of Psalm 91. Because he holds fast to me in love, I'll deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Jesus was comforted by these words that the Father was speaking to his king. So where does our great security and refuge lie in Psalm 91? Well, it comes through Jesus and his suffering. In Christ, we do not have to fear the terror of the night and the arrows that fly by the day, or any pestilence and destruction, verses 5 and 6, not because we are immune to the hardships in this world, but because one day we will be brought safely through them in ultimate security in the kingdom of God. A refuge for the people of God is not refuge from suffering and death, but refuge from ultimate death and suffering. Psalm 91 doesn't promise us that the worst of this world will not come upon God's people, but when it does, God promises us that we will not be alone or abandoned or ultimately destroyed. We will have a promise of ultimate security at Calvary. No matter what what comes our way in this world, virus or disease or hardship or suffering, we know that in Christ we have true security and refuge. We can say these these words in in verse 2 with confidence. I will say to the Lord, in Jesus, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So where do we find true security and refuge in this uncertain world? Or we find it in the suffering king. We abide in the shadow of the Almighty by abiding in Jesus. We, d- we dwell in the shelter of the Most High by taking shelter by faith in God's Son. Our desperation to seek security was never meant to be found in this world, in, in the things of this world that Satan promises us. Evil and pestilence, the coronavirus, are only limited to this life. The worst evil, which is eternal separation for God, will never come near us. And as we face all these things, we know that God is using everything for his glory and his good. Jesus, as he died on the cross, faced the extreme evils of men and Satan permitted and planned by God. And this brought about the greatest salvation the world has ever seen and will ever see and brought the most glory to God. God was doing his best work through the loneliest and darkest days in human history. And God is doing his best work now through one of the darkest days we've seen in human history for a while. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Paul was not rescued from death. Paul was in fact beheaded by Nero soon after writing this letter. But Paul was rescued in the fullest sense. God brought him safely 
into the heavenly kingdom he had promised. This is our hope in this time. This is our refuge in the time of crisis. We can hold on to this great truth of the psalm, that these promises will be fulfilled. One day, all these promises will not, to be, will not prove to be overstatements. All disease will be healed in the kingdom to come through faith in Jesus. Well, we, we will have all these promises. They are sealed in Jesus' blood. So in closing, God doesn't promise or pledge to us to keep us from worldly suffering and pain and trouble. But he does promise to be with us and rescue us in his perfect timing. Listen to these words from the great Charles Spurgeon who described the meaning of Psalm 91. It is impossible that any ill should happen to a man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him to his reward. Ill to him is not ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. Death is his gain. No evil in the strictest sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Happy is he who is in such a case. He is secure when others are in peril. He lives when others die. I know, I know you long to feel safe and secure in this time that we are currently facing, and despite all your efforts, you have no guarantee of security in this life. This will not, this will not be the last virus or expression of brokenness in our world. Death and disease will eventually come to us, or we cannot outrun death. Who or what will be your refuge in this time? Where will you turn to for your shelter? Our hearts are wired to seek security and feel the weight of our vulnerability. But we were never meant to find it in this world. We were always meant to find it in the refuge of Jesus. So in this time of disease and death, confronting us all in a new and real way, let us turn to find true security in Jesus because he offers us life that lives past the grave. May God be with us all at this time and may we, be, may we hold tightly onto these promises in Psalm 91 through Jesus. Verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that this psalm is our psalm and we can claim these promises in Jesus. Lord, thank you that Jesus is our refuge in the time of crisis. Lord, I pray that as we seek to obey our government, as we seek to find security in this world, we, we pray that we might do it for your glory and your good, that you might use this time uh, of rubble to bring about the greater salvation of your people and that you would bring many more people into your kingdom through this time. Lord, would you be with us all? May we love and serve you even at this time. In prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.